Welcome to AEC Stories, the USS Mount Hood podcast. This is former SM3 Dempsey, and I'm doing this live from a coffee shop with my former SM2 Dalton, uh, one of my bosses, one of the guys that taught me the way of the world through the Navy, how to be a signalman. And uh, today, the title of our podcast is called Signalman of the Watch, and we want to talk about ship collisions, preventing them, and how valuable the signalman was as a rating in the Navy and we're only realizing it 20 years later, the more collisions we see, we know that they could have been prevented. So, Mike, there you are. <laughs> what do you get to say on that? <laughs> hey, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, everything we've been point, talking about. Pointed at you, though, because it's... It makes a lot of sense, everything we've been talking about, uh, following up. Um, I know we were talking not too long ago after these ship merchant, merchant ships and Navy ships colliding, and we was, I think we all kind of send a text message especially signalmen yeah we send out a text message in wtf you know just w wtf asking what you know what the fuck it's true <laughs> i mean on you're not on facebook because uh basically your career as a male model draws a lot of stalkers so you keep it <laughs> private <laughs> And being a signalman, usually signalmen were the more attractive people in the Navy. It's just been statistically proven. I'm just bullshitting you guys, having fun with you, seeing if you're staying up with us. But uh, bringing it back to the topic, um, we realized who was on watch. Why did you get hit? Why did you not see that ship? Because we saw that ship every time. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you recall a time where you're out there spotting major contacts, seeing anchor detail, anything like that? I know it's a long time ago, but... um. I was thinking about the time when we were coming uh, several times when we were in the middle of the Indian Ocean when everybody's trying to be the first one to to spot the Russian ship. Right. You know, what what, what did we call them back then? They were uh, AGIs. AGIs. They look like trawlers. And I remember the first time we we discovered the signal bridge, we discovered it and we, we found it and it was like... Yeah, Chief Hill was walking around with his nuts used that day, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean to do something like that, that important, and understand the importance it is to the you know to the ship, and and the importance it is to to our world, to the to the nation. You know, that's what we do. We protect the seas and the first line know, of defense, right? So, right. I mean, um, just things like that, spotting things. I remember. You remember the time when we were over by the ship? Were you on the ship when we was over by the Rock of Gibraltar? Um, no, that was the World Cruise, so oh, you were there. So this we is a were, good one. We are going through and um, saw a periscope coming down the side of the ship. It was a freaking sub out there. Yeah. A sub. You spotted that. Spotted it. Right. Spotted it. Because we were over by over by the rock of Gibraltar. So everybody is oohing and on over this thing. And we're like, they're like, well, there's a sub out here. Like there's a sub out here. And, the, and that ship didn't have surface radar. It only, only had surface radar. You didn't have sonar on that ship. Um, Mount Hood? No, we didn't have. We didn't have, we didn't have sonar? I don't think we had below surface. We were all surface radar from what I understood, <sighs> what I was told. I remember that thing was close. It was like closer than from here to across the street, man. Just to see the periscope coming. When our ship went right down the side of it, yeah. I was like, that could have been a major catastrophe. You, yeah. You know, a ship colliding with a submarine. Yeah, you spot it. We were the radar. <laughs> I mean, you think a signalman and, and other signalmen that are listening to this and people that don't know why we're so prideful about what we did, mm-hmm. you know, you're a stud for everything that you prevented but there's really no glory in it. But what you, what you prevented is not in the news. Yeah. It was not on the news 25, 30 years ago. No. And, and we didn't have a sonar, and we were spotting the damn submarines with yeah. our eyes because the signalman's watch standards were so high. And there, I was on the, uh, the signalman board on Facebook. Another gentleman, another former signalman, mentioned having spotted periscopes as well. Yeah. And it tells you the standard of a signalman. It wasn't just our ship. I'm not taking all the glory, right? man. It's it's it's. Um, I mean, it's amazing. It 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 was close enough to when I put it like this: when we used to do unwrap, yeah, how close the ships were, it could have went down. It could have went right, right down the middle of it. Right, could have easily done that. Wow, that's close. Yeah. 
So, so looking at the submarine, I mean, that takes me back to when we were doing ref tray in San Diego, we were doing training exercises and war simulation and stuff. And basically, uh, brought to you by Mustang. Nice, nice uh, mufflers. Thanks, buddy. Anyways, uh, <laughs> he needs to be seen. But anyways, there was a submarine that dragged a barge under the water and drowned the whole tugboat crew because the wire was hanging, the tow wire was hanging below, mm -hmm. well, not wire, but steel cabling. Mm -hmm. The sub was so powerful, it towed it under. So if you want to talk about the impact of a sub and a ship, it's probably even worse. It's like a huge torpedo mm -hmm. hitting your ship. It's just not, you know, full of explosives armed that way. But mm -hmm. just think how the impact of that would have been if that hit the ship, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, One thing to have a cruiser, but a subsurface you, hit would be in a pretty bad part of the ship to get hit. The, were you on the ship when the? Um, I'm gonna put that back here because. Were you on the ship when the uh, when the fighter jet was was towing the um, the the like a little small missile behind it? Yeah, it was I think like so. Two miles behind it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. On a cable. Yeah. And then this, and then um, freaking shot that sucker down. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Uh, it's impressive to see the technology. It's impressive. Um, so you've seen, what, what we're talking about sounds subtle, but we're talking about the efficiency of a signalman. And people just thought, well, oh, a bunch of flag dancers up there. Yeah. There's our cheerleaders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's even, I always ask myself, it's even hard to spot ships at nighttime. Yeah. You know, you think it's hard. Oh, well, it's going to be lit up. We're going to see it. No, you necessarily don't see it. Bad guys run dark sometimes. Yeah, Shut off that port and start. But when they're on the horizon, they right. can have a light on. But when they're on the horizon, you might not necessarily see it, depending on what type of night it is. You know, how many how many stars is out? How illuminated is it? You know? So, well, we had the starlight scope and we had infrared. So I caught, I said this in another podcast, but I caught... Iranian pirates in a black zodiac at night with no running lights or nothing. The starlight scope, it was a pretty yeah, dark night, yeah. but there was enough, you know, luminosity or whatever you want to call it that you could see them. I caught them off the starboard side. They had snuck right past the destroyer. Wow. They were between us and the destroyer in our battle. So, bridge. what did you guys do when you caught it? I just called it down to the bridge. Bridge called the destroyer. Destroyer chased them off. You know? Oh, you guys didn't have a right to like light it up? Not really. We were underway, we weren't anchored. Uh huh. And everybody, it was, this is was like three in the morning. So nobody's on high alert watch. We don't have our, you know, shipboard security. They just called them. There was no metal. There's nothing yeah. because it was nothing that happened. It's not like you're, but, but think about it. If those guys had gotten to the fan tail, well, any one of you guys in the Navy, I'm not going to build this for any civilians to get any which, ideas. Which ship was that? Um, remember years ago, the ship that was tied up and they came in. It came in and freaking the coal, the USS the coal. coal. Remember that? So, I mean, that's the same situation. What could happen? Right. Oh, put that at you because once you're recording to be off, it'd be like over here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, Dick Marsenko, the guy that so supposedly um, started SEAL Team Six, at least he's got a lot of books about it. I always found them entertaining to read. Mm -hmm. Rogue Warrior and stuff. I'm like, pretty inspirational, cool stuff. I like that kind of story. I believe a lot of it's real. I'm sure some of it was classified, but. He did a thing called Red Cell. And Red Cell, we had it while we were in the Navy. Remember they'd come raid the base like a Navy SEAL team would see mm -hmm. if they could get past base security and they mm -hmm. would run security drills to make sure we were tight? Mm -hmm. So maybe something like that hadn't been running when the coal got hit. But I know that they sp sent in a special group of Marines, a special type of guard that is totally badass. They sent them in embassies and stuff like that that really set up a perimeter that keep away anything from coming in right. afterwards, after right. people died. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I mean, you got to be on high alert. You get to think about the value of that vessel, what mm -hmm. it means, mm -hmm. what it means to someone's psychology. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's lives period. You know, the, the lives period on there, man, the, I mean, just look at all the lives that they just lost by that collision. That's more important than the boat. Yeah. But the boat is, it goes, and and the degree then, of importance is the and life. And on top of that, yeah, the, it took them, what, it took them at least a week to find all of the bodies up in, inside of there. The divers had to go in, right? Yeah. And it's like, 
think of the grief that the family not knowing. Oh, I know. It, maybe he's lost his seat. Maybe he is alive. Maybe he's not. You know what I'm saying? All that type of stuff. And they're just hoping they're not getting that knock on the door. Exactly. Because, but, but what I'm saying is they had a delay. They had a delay in theirs because they, they weren't found. They weren't found right away. But I'm saying, where has the importance of communications, the importance of, of, of what they're supposed to do? You never, the military gave, originally had segment for a reason. Yeah. Because you wanted to cut costs, most likely is why they got rules like, well, what, what can we cut costs in the military? What can we shrink rates at? Ironically, we were one of the cheapest sources of, yeah. of manpower. Yeah. Because a lot of it, the algorithm of what we did ran in our I can head. understand that. Right? I, can, I can understand that. Right. I, I, I wouldn't doubt it because, I mean, we could be boats and mates if we wanted to. Right. Because we pretty much were, but we, we just were boats and mates in a small area. But. We were the luxury boats and mates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, we were, but we were on watch all the time. That was our job. And we were looking to validate our luxury of sitting in the best view of the ship, Mm -hmm. having the 360 view, having that elite status, we had to validate it by showing effort and results. And we also look for the signals because we had high standards. If you were not doing your watch, you were going to hear about it from every other signalman. It was like done. Or I don't, you know, know, I would, I would even understand if they would have just reduced it and just say, we don't need this many signalmen on one ship if they felt that way. But I would still have at least one person, you could that. have two signalmen that are standing twelve hour watches with the bosun made accompaniment. I mean that kind of thing. I mean, you know, but but you need but you need that sleep. I mean, we had eight yeah, on eight yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, not the twelve hours, man. That was a suck watch right there, man. Well, that's that's you know, there's a lot of guys. Now, what they said, they're the Navy suffering sleep deprivation. Mm-hmm. Okay, people, a guy that you're paying, I don't know, mm, twenty five thousand dollars a year or less, whatever the Navy pays the E one through three, you know. Maybe they're paying thirty-five. Let's just say they're paying a guy thirty-five grand a year to be a signalman. Mm-hmm. Is that there's there's how many ships? Four hundred ships. There's your number right there, right? So thirty-five times a hundred is three hundred fifty thousand times four, twelve, five, four. Let's just say fourteen, one point four million a year in salaries, right? Mm-hmm. Compared to how much did the damage of that ship cost, right? Exactly. Right, and exactly. that's just one guy. You get a double it and maybe triple it for the size of your signal team. Mm-hmm. But that's if you had one guy conducting it, raising the standards, training the bosun's made the watch, overseeing the quartermasters, making sure they were up to that one guy, mm-hmm. like a, a signalman chief on every ship. But see, a, also a, a lot of signalmen served as mass at arms, so they had dual jobs. I did too. So we is, all the, did. is the mass at arms still there? Uh, I think master at arms is still there, but. Um, we had, uh, let's see how many signalmen we had on our crew, because that tells you how many lookouts we had. We always had two to a watch, and in the daytime, we were about six to eight deep, right? There was you, Hill, Muter, Chief, Stroud, Farnham, me, and Primka. That's eight. about eight, eight yeah. deep. Yeah, it was eight deep. So we could run so three about, watches yeah. easy, and yeah. everybody's getting enough rest, yeah. and someone can be fighting a fire and yeah. you know, working on the flight deck like I did for a while. Yeah, that was it. Because every couple of days you get that, that midnight watch or the one where you had to get up at four in the morning. Ugh. Oh, I hated that motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't really like that. I think my worst one was a midnight watch because when, then you, you fucking, you try to get some sleep right before you get to go on this shit. <laughs> you can't go to sleep and you got to get up. You're, yeah, because you want to watch the... You want to watch the movie. Right. You want to watch the movie. Everybody hanging out. Did you did you go to sleep? And then next thing you do, know, do zipping your curtains over. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, Leonard, Leonard yeah. it's time to get up, man. Yeah, pulling them curtains out you of know. your little metal box you're sleeping in. <laughs> it's uh. It, and the, was it a heavy night of drinking? The previous. <laughs> <laughs> is, is he still hungover? I mean, we're keeping this candid and just real couple real last signal men here. We're not even trying to. This isn't my. Uh, I want to talk to the Secretary of the Navy. And uh, I'd like to share my knowledge and all of my other signalmen's knowledge and help design a training program because w- what's my motivation? It's not to become a billionaire off the idea and be the next Blackwater. I, I know I have the knowledge and I know the people have the knowledge. It's, I want the safety of my country Why not? to be number one. 
<laughs> if I can benefit some retired signalmen, great. But I'm but, just asking. I'm just asking the question <laughs> that, that everybody. I know somebody else is saying, "Why not?" Well, legally, legally, I don't work, but and I'm, I, I would just be glad to consult and give it right to my fellow shipmates and fellow signalmen. Um, and I'm not. I can't work a 40 hour week. There's no way I can show up for one or two things. I could give you my layout and hand it off to the you and the right people, and it would be running. I just want. I want to feel that people that have the same standards as me are handing down those same standards to the next generation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I want these young people to be on watch like we were. Because now we're, we're, we're over in the birthing of life. We're over sitting here in the States. We're going to the beach. We're hanging out with our wife. Who's looking out for threats off the shore right now? Yeah. Some computer? The TR-1000? <laughs> Stay looking at it, man. It's crazy. I mean, who's, who's looking out? Yeah. When you get rid of that human watch, there's an old saying, Mike, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Thomas it would, Jefferson. It would, it would, it, that's, that's, that's a good, that's a good quote, what you just said. It would be, it actually would be for me, myself, to actually go on the newest ship that they have out right now and take a look at the technology compared yeah. to when, my last ship I was ever on was a Mount Hood. Yeah. So... I have a lot of questions. I, I, I'm sure I would be impressed with some of the technology. I would be like, "Wow, this is." And they go inside of the um, the OS room, inside of the OS room, CIC, CIC. That would be pretty cool to go in now versus what it used to look like. Now it probably just looks like a bunch of supercomputers. Yeah, yeah. But you know, because we could just look at technology as civilians, what we have access to. Right. They probably had access to some of it first, not what we have today, but right. Ten years ago, yeah. whatever. When we were in the Navy, they were probably four or five, six years ahead. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, signalmen are generally pretty smart people. I mean, you had to be pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of stupid signalmen that I met. And most of you guys and myself, we all did pretty well when we get out of the military. Mm -hmm. We didn't just fall down because we set a high standard. I think by being on watch and looking at the world from the signal bridge, looking for problems, solving problems, communicating it did something about your transition as a civilian. It, it just a mindset, I think. Yeah, well, I think the whole military structure is something. I bet you all of us have that. The ones, well, I mean, you could define success any way you can. I, I'm like, am I able to do whatever I want to do in life? That's, that's success for me. I don't put True. a number on it. However much money I need to do it, you know, I, I somehow do what I want to do in life. So what I'm saying is that I have structure. You, you have some type of structure. That was one thing that we had to have, right? We had to have <clears throat> a high standard of accountability. And I carried that into my civilian life, as did you. Accountability. Um, Professionalism. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what, we, that's what I draw from it. Attention to detail. Yes. Attention to detail is the word I'm looking for. Right. You had to have that. Yeah, you, you probably to. got me when my gig line was out or <laughs> I well, didn't shine my boondockers, right? But, but that attention to detail applied to everything. It, it, it applied to everything about even your job, what you were doing, because, it, you know, that's why you was the guy, were you the guy that everybody was talking about who did something on watch last night and didn't see something, you know? Ironically, that, that story went with me and whoever was on the bridge, and they conveniently for, you know, forgot it. And then I just like, oh, that was a watch. But I stayed on watch for eight days, and I'd like tell Stroud, no, nah, no, nah, go back to the birthing. I got this watch because no one else saw it. Yeah. And I went in hypervigilance. Yeah. And basically, it's haunted me ever since. Yeah. So when I see an event like this, I'm the first guy that that triggers me. I'm like, and it doesn't trigger me like, oh, it's more like, yeah, I know exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. From experience, it flashes me right back to that. Yeah. It's kind of like if a sniper sees a guy take a shot and miss a target and he sees the trajectory, he's like, man, and he could have been a sniper 20 years ago. He knows how he didn't sight the scope. He knew the reflective vision. Yeah. Same thing with us. I mean, but yeah, the accountability, attention to detail, as menial as that sounds, think about what it means in life, right? I mean, this podcast, I keep doing it every week because I have accountability and attention to detail and follow through. And mm -hmm. those, the three values that I got from you guys that trained me, those made a big difference in my life. So you answered my question. Right. You think so, huh? Yeah. What do you think a training program would look like 
if we were to coordinate with all the signalmen, you know, some of the <clears throat> signalmen, command master chiefs, and that would actually be it would actually be really good. It would have to spend, I would say, maybe maybe meet for a weekend at a hotel somewhere. Yeah, meet up and just. I mean, because you want to talk, you want to talk, you want everybody's point of view. Nobody, everybody's point of view is respected, and and just talk and just you you'll find that common thread in there. You know right. what I'm saying? After talking for a while, or it can be share just, experience. Or it could it's just a, be a, it could just be one long day. You know, it's a brain uh, trust. It's right, a brain trust. Right. So, and have a time to where every you know everybody just sit down and just and just uh, just talk about it. Yeah, I think um, I think sharing of the knowledge. I made a post on Facebook before I started this recording, and um, I don't know. I think uh, what I said was we were all in different kinds of ships. They all had different kinds of superstructures. We had different. Sometimes we had a little variance in equipment. Mm-hmm. Some people had IR infrared. Some didn't. Some people just had starlight scopes. Yeah. Some people had. Uh, um, they were on a carrier, so you get all this flight action in coordination with their ship spotting. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot going on. And on the Mount Hood, it was pretty straightforward. We had an easy 360 degree from 180 degrees with both big eyes. Nothing fore and aft could get out of line of sight. Yeah. We could see everything. Yeah. So it just depends. Because I was on a carrier yesterday. Well, I was on the Hornet, who I planned to talk to on Tuesday. And uh, they let me on the signal light and on the bridge. And I saw some a half empty flag bag. And I was like, man, I don't want to attack any flags, <laughs> but I was on there and, um, you know, I was just thinking about, it. I was like, this aircraft carrier signal bridge layout is so different than mine. And I'm like, what would I be doing up here? I'd have to talk to a carrier who was on a signal bridge. I mean, a signal bridge who was on a carrier, a signalman that served under there and, and Ask them, what was it like? You get jets blasting by, you get loud noises, you get stuff firing off, you get choppers laying out, mm-hmm. and you're looking, and those are other distractions to your line of sight while you're out there doing your signalman duties, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and then there's other ships where you might not be able to see the fantail that well, or you might not be able to see aft as well. You have to walk around. So maybe there's something like a blind spot that people aren't addressing. Exactly. And that would be part of my investigation right. or assisting an investigation right. to evaluate. Because there are, it's, it's easy for people to just stare off the one side to the wide open sides. Right. But it's that, those angles that, that, that uh, like that 10 degree. Yeah. That 10 degree starboard or maybe, maybe in between five and, and, you know, it's just up in there where there's stuff that's obstructing, not as a clear view, you know, or the sun or the sun is facing, right. It's facing towards you where you're looking at. That's right. You that, can hide that behind takes, that sun. Uh, you can hide behind that, that sunlight. That takes a good eye. That it takes does. a good eye to look through that. Well, our standard of watch was we had to have 20-20 vision, remember? Mm-hmm. That was part of the rating. They wouldn't let you be a signalman unless you had 20-20 vision. It was interesting. And you had to have, you had to be able to get a clearance. If you had any bad history, you weren't going to become a signalman. That probably was the only thing that really benefited me getting out was having that clearance. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it, it allowed for me to... I was able to put that down on when I was applying for jobs and job you know, application. It didn't have to take that minimum wage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that helped out. So after serving seven years in the military, man, you were only 13 years away from retirement. I know. But today, as much as like we, a lot of us left the Navy. We wanted. We were watching TV. We wanted to aspire to be <laughs> Magnum PI or somebody else. You know what I mean? And we wanted to live that glorious life. And become rich and prosperous or live on a farm, depending what your motivation was, whatever it was. But I would go back today to help out, not because, you know, just because of sense of duty, but right. to make sure everything's okay. Just to, just to contribute. I don't really, you know, I'm not looking at this as a profiteer. I'm looking at this as a, a man that has a little bit of knowledge that I can pass on to the young generation that I never, I never thought that our position would be this valuable. Because I did it, just I just did the job. And then well, I look now, back at it, you and know. I now, see what yeah, it is. now when I, you look at it, it's like a rate that's not there anymore. And here you're somebody that's very knowledgeable in it, and you also was doing it during wartime. You know, that's right. you, you you bad guys and your standard duty watch. Yeah, so right. I'm saying, I'm saying you. That's that's some good knowledge for somebody 
uh, not only good knowledge, but it's it's it, it can benefit somebody out there who, you know, and, and it could be somebody that might want to go back and, you know, maybe history of class or something. And the teacher's talking to him. Well, I want to talk about a rate that used to be in the Navy that no longer is there. The, yeah. The, the values or what what this rate did, you know, and they talk about those type of things. And then you turn around and you come back. You know. I can get a movie made about it. I could film it and make my own stuff because I play around on the computer and I know how to film. But I really want to give this to the I want this to go to the Navy. I don't want it to get caught up in some bureaucracy. I think the article that I read, Secretary of the Navy was saying, hey, we got to reach to the graybeards. We have to reach to the people that were here before. And um, that either may mean old officers or that may mean people that have gray beards. You know, it's subjective to me. I don't really, when I say gray beard, I just think about my beard that's gray. Yeah. But, but I look at it and like, yes, us old salts, the old seamanship that worked for Columbus, the pilgrims. You know, uh, Amigo Vespucci, Amerigo Vespucci, um, the Vikings, come on, you mm-hmm. know, the pirates looking out to get other people. The pirates had good signalmen because they could spot you and sneak up on you. Well, you know, I mean, everybody has a different terminology when we read something, just like we all we all can look at the same sign. But everybody, if, when you ask somebody what they see, the first thing out their mouth could be different. You know what I'm saying? But <clears throat> it's true what you're saying, though. Right. It's. Uh, I would sleep better at night because I think about it. We get the threat of North Korea Mm -hmm. and we don't exactly look as mighty as we are. We are mighty and we have plenty of resources that we can recover, but it's not good PR and it's not worse, worse than that. It's the death of young sailors that were putting in their hard work and now they don't get to go home. Yeah, because what is he, he, he he was saying that that one that he fired over Japan, that was meant for Guam. Yeah. (laughs) He's like letting you know I could reach it. What kind of ships are these? These ships are battleships we're talking about. These are not like you're taking out our tow truck of ships or it's not a tender that you ran into. Even though a tender is very important what it does, Mm -hmm. it's not the front line like these ships. These are like some of our – it's like if you had a garage full of cars, a couple of your Ferraris get dented really hard. Yeah, but if he he wants the result of that, man, he he get that one off of it. It's going to be over like quick, man. Now, we've got the, we, there was an article I just read today. One of our ships just blew missiles out of the sky, no problem. Like, go ahead, just uh, just shoot. Yeah. Take yeah, a shot. That's what I'm saying. We'll blow, you know, what are you threatening us with? It's like, there's and a it, kid with a slingshot, and you get a, a friggin' AR-15 with a you yeah, know, beautiful saying. scope on it. And they, and they got them bunker-busting missiles, man, that it don't matter how far down in the ground you are, buddy. That's right. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's like... The, the bad thing is all those poor people have been held oh, yeah, against their will, and they don't, don't they don't know any different. They've been brainwashed sad, by a dictator. That's, that's the sad part of it. Right, man. that's the sad that's, part. That's and it's very, like you're blowing up people hate. that probably don't deserve it, and we've been trying to find a solution to that, right? Yeah. But yeah. they don't know better. They've been trained to, you know, it's like a dog. You train it to be a tech dog. Oh, yeah, though, I watched that whole special on it right? on, uh, on Vice TV. They were showing a thing of how they were over there in North Carolina. They went behind, and dude was filming and everything, and he was showing how in the schools, I mean, in grade school, they're actually in class. And, and Come on, North Korea? Thanks yeah. North Carolina. <laughs> North Korea. When they're, showing, when they're showing them the books and things about history, the Americans are bad. We're bad. They teach them that. Yeah, you're brainwashed. And, and any culture, religion, I mean, and so forth. Right. The illustration and everything. Right. It's How the Americans, we're probably like, they think we're vampires full of magic words. We're like that, the clan, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say it. We like the clan. That's crazy. That's insane, man. So, yeah, of course you're terrified and you're going to fight war against the, the, the American boogeyman that's coming to get you. I mean, people hate the clan, man. You know what I'm saying? You hate that's the clan. Right. So I'm saying that's how North Korean, that's how they're, that's how they're brainwashed coming through school is to look at, look at like that. And, and it's like crazy, man. It, it, you get the wrong type of dictatorship, man. Well, the same thing goes for all the bad media that's dividing and conquering our nation from within. It's the same thing. It's like, oh, those people of that colored skin said that your colored skin's bad and and vice versa. Or they don't like the way they don't like your religion or they don't like the way you guys play uh, at paddle ball or something. Or, you know, uh, those guys with red shoes that play Frisbee, they're real jerks. I mean, they're just dividing. You don't play Frisbee with red shoes. Well, you're not cool. Well, so now I'm starting a little rift, and they build. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's easy to convert a whole country. I mean, Hitler did it. So North Korea is no different. Any extreme dictatorship, right? 
But that's just it. I mean, if, if, if we're on watch, it's going to be that much more efficient. That's more, that more less cost in tax dollars to the Americans. And it's also going to be more lives saved and a safer country. More than even, you know, I'm sympathetic. I, I may not be laying it down enough about how bad I feel for those fallen shipmates. But I really want to get to the point of step two, past this, future mm-hmm. pacing this. I want that to not happen again, happen again, number one. Number two, if we up the standards with what we learned as signalmen and, and taught it to the Navy, we would be doing higher level, more touchdowns. Mm-hmm. This football team was going to win more touchdowns. Mm-hmm. That's just true mm-hmm. because we, we upped our game. We increased our cardio. We increased our vigilance, you know? Um, yeah, because I never, me joining the military and going into the Navy, I always felt as though that was the safest place for me to go. <laughs> yeah, and now it's proving otherwise. It's only as safe. It goes back to that Thomas Jefferson quote. Now you're running quote. into merchant ships? Yeah, right. It, it, it's like the, the quote of eternal vigilance, right? Like I just told you. And that's really life. If you drop your six, if you drop your, your watch in life, people will sneak up on you, con you, rob you. Yeah. It's the same in real world as it is on the signal bridge. Oh, yeah. It's a I small mean, well, little guess, metaphor. You know, I guess it's just like, you wouldn't never expect a ship. I know some military planes, jets go down. You know, they crash, exercises, collide, and I mean, it happens. Yeah. Those things happen. You know, I, I understand. But I still never even imagine a ship. Things like that happening to a ship. Getting hit by the tanker. I mean, even the USS Cole having a freaking, you know, one of the small craft come up on the side and do what they did. I just... I always, I mean, when I, when I think military, I think of security. But you got to think that realistically we need to train people, even if it annoys them, because we were annoyed when we were taught, everyone was on your ass. Hey, dude, you didn't shine your belt buckle. You didn't do the bright work. That attention to detail was the difference between when you were on watch that night, when you were scanning the horizon, you saw that light, you saw that stack. You didn't go, I'll look at it when it gets a little bigger, Mm -hmm. when it comes over the horizon more. No, you ran in, you get Jane's fighting ships, you went and compared, you took your mental picture and you went back out and you said, okay, I see they get a ball on top, that's a Russian uh, satellite ship or spy ship or that's a destroyer. Oh, it's uh, Iranian Navy, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. You were doing it before they were. Mm -hmm. And you knew that we were the best trained signalmen in most of the Navy in the world. I mean, there's some great Aussies and British people that take it just as serious, so Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, but it was mainly English language speaking navies that had the signalman skills and i think the americans always had the best training usually but but no offense to my listeners in australia because i know you're out there and you guys are badass i've communicated with you out in the gulf did semaphore it was great you're on point so you know they understood your semaphore they did they did they're like (laughs) (laughs) they had an accent on theirs (laughs) they're like why does he keep sending dude no that's a, that's a funny part about there being Californian. Did you see oh, it? Oh, yeah. You see it? I got, yeah, you're on watch. <laughs> Was that 280? <laughs> you guys won't know what that means. <laughs> Mike was just looking at a Ferrari. There it goes. Yeah, we're downtown at a coffee shop, but when it gets to professional grade, I think that we can make some differences. And I, I just had one other little question here. So, Mike... What was watch like? You were on a frigate before, right? Mm-hmm. Before the Mount Hood, which was mm-hmm. an auxiliary ship. Mm-hmm. What was the signal bridge setup difference? What was the standards? What was that crew like compared to the Mount Hood objectively? Our, we didn't have a we didn't have an actual signal bridge. We oh no, were, we were on the um, we had a desk on the um, on the bridge. Oh wow! Yeah, we were we were up on the bridge, but the we had structure was different. Yeah, we had like um, in the back. Now we had a. Well, we kept our supplies, but we were on the bridge. We didn't have our own little space. Now, we can, you go on the bridge, and then you can open a door, and you can go inside. And we had like a, it was like a little room that was a signalman thing. But when you think about it, why would you go in there? Because there's no windows or anything. There's nothing so, you can't see. So you need, you always had to be on the bridge, or you had to be out on the, you know, on the, either port side or, or, or starboard side, you know. So... That was that was 
So that coming was the to the one Mount Hood, we, were, we had the luxury condo up there. Yeah, yeah. We, we had, had the, one of the nicest signal bridges in the Navy. Yeah, I we think. had that big, you know, it was, you had view all the way around. I think view all the way around, except in the middle, right? Wasn't yeah. it in the middle? It, we couldn't see? Well, we could see behind us because we had aft windows. So we could see fore and aft, 180 degrees, probably maybe, I would say, yeah, 180. 180. I thought, was our glass straight across? It was straight across, yeah. and then we had two. It aft- wasn't a stack in front. Well, it was a stack behind us. Yeah, but you could still see straight yeah, back yeah, to the yeah, fan yeah, tail. There yeah. might have been one uh, five degrees that was like you just had to walk out and peer your head over. Yeah, we had to walk out and and, and kind of look around. You had that, that one dead spot, but um, yeah, that, that's why I'm be- not being presumptive when I say, yeah, we'll help train your signalman. We'll help get signalman back because I don't know. Like, see, I just asked you, and you just answered my question. What was your signal bridge like on before you get to the Mount Hood? But they weren't all the same. And like I said, the carrier would be different, too. Yeah, the carrier would be much different. Um, I've been on a destroyer before. Destroyer. Um, what was the signal bridge like there? It was better than the. Than, it had an actual signal bridge, kind of similar to the Mount Hood, but smaller. But they did have an actual signal bridge. It was like a 360 view signal bridge. Yeah, they had the windows view. around all the yeah, way around. The windows the around the box. But smaller. Okay. Smaller, but uh, phone booth you, with you, windows everywhere. You think about it, man. When you when you go on these ships, and you know, it's like, man, because I was on the Kurtz. The Kurtz was a brand new ship. So when I went on that destroyer, I was like, man, we this old vintage. You know, everything looks old and this and that. But then I went on the uh, uh, New Jersey New Jersey uh, signal bridge too, because the the New Jersey was stationed in Long Beach when they when they brought it back in. Right. They, they, it was over there in Long Beach, so we went over there on the ship, man. And you're talking about a damn ship. Yeah. <sighs> Beautiful ship. Well, as I'm talking to you, I'm going to look on here and give a shout-out to a couple guys. Okay. And we will be here, Signal in the Watch, give us your feedback, um, kind of sharing our thoughts on how we can prevent more shipwrecks and uh, the, you know, the value of our job. You know, And some of it may not have been pushed as hard. But it's all legitimate as far as, you know, I'm concerned. Um, so I, I'm talking with this one gentleman, Jerry Gennett. Hey, just want to say thanks for talking to me on Facebook. And uh, what's up to Randy Fields? You guys are all signalmen on the signalman group. Uh, Kevin Lewis, how are you doing? John Hurtado, you know, uh, hope you're enjoying the podcast. Hope you listen. I'd be glad to have any of you other signalmen on. Share your sea stories, how you prevented wrecks, and how we can help keep the Navy safer. And, uh, hey, enjoy Labor Day, everybody, and thanks for being on, Mike. Thank you. I, re- I really enjoyed it, and um, please keep me updated on the feedback. You know, it would be great to hear somebody else's point of view or whatever they want to say. or For sure. Or and, expand on it. And, and you can follow us on, on Facebook at AEC Stories. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on AEC Stories, AEC Stories dot podbean dot com and we're also on itunes just look up for aec stories the uss mount hood podcast uh we we plan on expanding uh, i'm going to add a few more ships i'm looking i'm open to interviewing anyone from any other ship and if you get a good sea story feel free to email me on the facebook page or hit me up on instagram under the uss mount hood ae 29 and uh thank you for listening and uh have a good one A dream. We were sipping a whiskey neat, highest for the Bowery, and I was high enough. Where along the lines, I've seen eye to eye, we were seeing all night.